Hey everyone, and welcome back to our study. We're in Luke chapter 8, verse 16. And we're going to go through 16 through 21 today. If you don't have a copy of the notes, there are links down in the description where you can get those. Jesus has just told the parable of the sower. So keep that in mind as we discuss these verses, because it's going to tie in. Let's just read verse 16 to start off. Jesus says, No one after lighting a lamp covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed but puts it on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. A person lights a lamp to fill a dark space with light, right? I mean, that's pretty counterintuitive. We turn on the light so that we can see when we walk into the dark house. It wouldn't make sense if somebody lit a lamp or a flame, not a candle, you know, back then in the first century, or their torch, and then they hid the light under a basket or, a, you know, something else and, and said, oh, I, I don't want... I don't want this light to shine anywhere. That would be weird. You might be committed to the mental hospital for a few days if you tried to do that. If you didn't want light to be spread, you wouldn't have lit the light in the first place, right? So why does Jesus bring this up? I mean, <laughs> what is the point of this statement? Well, Jesus is described as the light of the world. He was bringing light, spiritual light, hope, into a world that was full of darkness and sin. He was shedding light on the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, and he was doing it with the intention of eventually sending that light, that message out to the entire world. Right now, his, his ministry and a lot of these, these uh, facts and truths about the kingdom of heaven were reserved kind of just for his close disciples. But the intention was eventually for them to take these things out and spread them around the entire world. And I think that this helps us to understand verse 17. So let's read verse 17. For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. The things that Jesus was teaching his disciples in private would eventually be taken around the world to everybody. He was going to entrust them with the gospel, and they were supposed to take the light to the world. So the disciples would be responsible for sharing what they would learn from Jesus with those who had never spoken to Jesus, never heard about Jesus, uh, and, and that was his intention all along. The secret things that he was sharing would come to light. Okay, then that brings us to verse 18. Take care then how you hear, for to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he thinks he has will be taken away. Now let me read that one more time, because I, I find the wording to be... A little bit tricky here. Take care then how you hear, for to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he thinks he has, will be taken away. Jesus wanted the disciples to be mindful about the way that they heard and received the word of God. Just like in the parable of the sowers, remember? He says here that the one who has, to him more will be given. Now we have to figure out who the one who has is, and what does that mean? What does he have? And what will he be given? I think, if I understand this correctly, that the person who has, what he has is an open mind. He has the, the honest and good heart that's talked about back during the, uh, the, the, good, the description of the good soil during the parable. He has a heart that wants to do what is right, he wants to serve God, and he is uh, moving in that, that direction. A person who hungers and thirsts after righteousness, as Jesus described it in Matthew chapter 5. And what Jesus is saying is, to him who has that kind of a heart, more will be given. He wants to serve God, God will nurture him. He will refine him, he will prune him so that he can continue in his growth and God can use him in his kingdom. Right? God will be there for that kind of a person. He will be given even more than what he has currently. Matthew 5 says that the one who hungers and thirsts after righteousness will receive an abundance and will be satisfied. I think that's kind of the same idea here. Now, in contrast, who is the one who has not and what doesn't he have? Well, I think it's kind of the same thing. This is a person whose mind and whose heart is not, it doesn't have that honesty, doesn't have that openness to the gospel, and they're closed off to the truth that Jesus is telling them through his words. Those who don't make any kind of application, Jesus's instructions. 
or those who maybe start off well, but they don't finish well. They get distracted. They put aside the convictions that they had from Christ's teaching, and they go back into the world, the rocky and the uh, thorny soil, remember? They hear the word, but any semblance of growth is taken away. Now, who's it taken away by? Well, we talked about it being taken away by Satan back in um, the, the wayside seed, in the parable of the sower. So it could be saying that Satan will take that away. It could also be saying that God will take it away. Just like the man who didn't properly steward his blessings in Matthew chapter 25. If you know the parable of, of the talents, there's um, the servants are given certain talents, a certain amount of money to steward for their master. And there's a servant who doesn't do that very well. And the master's instructions in Matthew chapter 28, or Matthew, Matthew chapter 25, verse 28 and 29. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has will more be given and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And so he didn't, he didn't use what the master gave him. He didn't apply the message of the master, the instructions of the master. And because of that, even what he had was taken away. If we're given opportunity and teaching and knowledge from God and we don't steward those things properly, then there may come a time when God takes our opportunity away. The disciples needed to do what? They needed to, quote, take care how they heard Jesus' words. You need to do that, do that evaluation of which soil am I? How am I going to receive this? I need to receive it well. I need to be open to this because if I am, God will be there to help me grow and to develop and to serve him and to be the man that he wants me to be. If not, though, um, I'm going to be in a bad place. They need to hold the truths in the good and the honest heart. That brings us then to verse 19, 19 through 21. We'll read all these together. Then his, then his mother and his brothers came to him, but they could not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. So this is kind of an interesting part of Luke's gospel. Someone notifies Jesus while he's teaching that his mother and his brothers are, he, are there and they want to see him. Now, we don't exactly know where Mary lived, but she very well might have lived back in Nazareth. Well, he's spending most of his time elsewhere. So she comes to see him with her children. Now, these would be the children that she had with Joseph after Jesus was born. There are some uh, religious bodies that teach that Mary never had any more children with Joseph after Jesus was born, but there's, there's nothing in the scriptures to suggest that. And I think reasonably, it seems that they they would have more children. And this seemed, well, this is, is clear that they did. <clears throat> now, these would technically be Jesus's like half, half brothers and sisters, because Jesus is not the biological child of Joseph. <laughs> he, so a little bit of a unique relationship here. Luke doesn't introduce us to Jesus's brothers um, by name, but Matthew does in Matthew chapter 13. He had James. Now James is going to become a very prominent member of the early church and, and very influential in the early church in Jerusalem. Then Joseph and Simon and Judas. It really seems like the Jews must have just like picked their names out of a hat of like 12 different names because everyone, <laughs> so many of the people that we've met, even in this short time in Luke's gospel, have the same names. We've met like three Simons. <laughs> we've met um, two, two Judases. Now we've got James. There's at least two James, James the less, and then another three James now, if I remember right. Uh, so it's like everyone has the same name. Uh, Joseph, I mean, apparently he was named after Joseph. He was Joseph Jr. But anyway, 
Now, as, as he so often did, Jesus took this opportunity where his family came to visit him and he, he turned it into a spiritual lesson. He told the people, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Now, I don't think Jesus is in any way disrespecting his mother. Obviously, she was a great servant of God in her own way. But he's using this to communicate the importance of the kingdom of heaven and the importance of being a servant of God and the relationship that being a servant of God puts you in. <clears throat> he was driving home the importance of the word of God and its hearers' hearts. So a seed in good soil held fast to the word of God. Uh, we kind of already said that. So here Jesus told the people that those who heard and did the will of God were part of the family of God. Now that's a, a really unique and incredible relationship. Usually servants, if you're a servant, that means you're not part of the master's family, right? The master's family, they get all the privileges and they get served. They don't do the serving. But here, if we serve God, he invites us in to be part of his family, which is an incredible, incredible gift. Uh, and definitely, well, it's, it's an honor for us, for anyone. <clears throat> so that's what Jesus is saying. Yes, there's an aspect to it that, that someone is a servant, but there's also an aspect that God opens himself up as a father to the people who accept his words. And that's amazing. The true family of God are those who identify with Jesus and accept his heaven-given message. And, it, you know, it's interesting and important to point out, and I think Jesus was doing this in part, that our blood relationship in Christ, our unity through Christ's blood with other Christians, is stronger than our genetic blood connection with our immediate family. And one of the bittersweet realities of life is that these people that you love, your family, the people that you share blood with, eventually they die and they pass away. And in death, that genetic line in your relationship is dissolved. What's beautiful, though, about the family of God is that if we have a relationship with somebody, if we're united with them through the blood of Christ that relationship doesn't dissolve in death. It's actually just reaffirmed in death. And the promise is, is that we're going to be able to be connected with that individual for all of eternity. That relationship is never broken because we'll be in heaven together with God. Uh, so those, I mean, you think about it, those are the kinds of relationships that we really want. And if we really love our blood family, we really try to make the bond between us an eternal one and not just a temporal one. And luckily, I'm able to have both with my family, but I know there's a lot of people that, that don't. And we should be, I mean, that's, that's real family, right? Well, you're going to be together forever. I don't know if that's a good thing for some people, but uh, no. Uh, that's what we should strive for. And that's, that's the beauty of the strength of what Christ has bought for us and the gift that we've been given in the, the purchase price of his blood. All right, so Jesus says, those people who follow my words, those are my mother and my brothers. What does he say there exactly? My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Okay, well, we will pick up in verse 22 in our next study. I hope you guys have a good day. And, um, yeah, I think that's all that I have to say.